Hello, my dear friends. Today, we will read the memoirs of a German tank crewman who fought as an assault gun crew member in the Großdeutschland Division. Non-commissioned officer Rudolf Salvermoser gives us some of his remarkable stories of war survival on the Eastern Front. Reading such recollections, you realize that surviving such a war requires more than just excellent military training. It also depends on a certain luck. His combat experience proves that. So now, let's begin. My military occupation specialty was that of a tank gunner. Again, during training, one was not just trained as a gunner, loader, driver, radio man, or tank commander. One was trained especially in one, and to a lesser extent, in the other four specialties. Naturally, a recruit could not expect to become a tank commander right away, but he was trained in the commander's duties should the need arise. After one had demonstrated certain aptitudes, for example, good shooting, an ear for Morse code, exceptional skill at driving, or being mechanically well inclined, one was chosen for that particular specialty. I displayed a particular aptitude for gunnery, but that was not just aiming and firing. You had to select the type of round required for the target, high explosive, armor piercing, etc. Estimate the distance to the target, advance the aim to correspond with the speed and direction of the moving target, and for all of this, you needed a somewhat analytical mind. Most gunners were chosen in regard to qualifications for potential commanders. Without meaning to brag, I was good enough to be sought out by tank commanders who were in a position to select a gunner. Of course, once you were assigned to a commander and his tank, you normally stayed with him unless he or you were wounded or killed. We never considered our role as soldiers as just another job. It was our duty and honor to be soldiers. We felt we had no other option than to be members of the armed forces. After all, there was a war. I was just the right age, and I felt like most other young people felt, that the only way to live was to fight for my fatherland, win the war, and then return in peace to rebuild my country. In the sense that we were dedicated and well-trained, we were professionals. Our capabilities were far superior to those of the Russians. Our Kampfgruppe task force alone was able to destroy five Russian tanks for every one we lost, and I believe that this ratio prevailed throughout the whole Russian front. Unfortunately for us, however, they probably had ten times as many tanks as we had. It was the quickness of our aim and response and the exactness of our hitting that made us superior. We were undoubtedly better trained and our aiming optics excelled theirs but our tanks were inferior as far as the thickness of the protective armor, engines too small for the tank's weight, and narrow tracks, which could not traverse muddy or swampy terrain, were concerned. Otherwise, because of our quickness, good training, and at least we thought so at the time, our mentality, we always seemed to be superior to the enemy we faced. When I say we, I am referring to the members of an elite division. This did not necessarily hold true for all other units along the Eastern Front or the other units within the Wehrmacht as a whole. During the two campaigns I served on the Eastern Front, I was wounded a total of four times. My first two wounds were received during the winter of 1943-44, around Narva on the Estonia-Russia border. Our tanks were assigned to guard a particular area along the edge of a forest. We were patrolling this sector while a Russian 17.2-centimeter artillery piece kept firing at us. Our procedure was to move our tank after every second or third impact of a Russian shell. It was during my turn as the observer, I was standing exposed in the turret hatch, that one of their rounds struck directly in front of our tank. The explosion tore off our drive wheel and thus disabled our vehicle. Hours later, we were towed back to the battalion operations post. After dismounting and going into a bunker, I decided to go out again and retrieve my stationery from the tank so I could write a letter or two. Just as I was about to dismount the second time, a Russian mortar round hit right on top of our tank. Naturally, my reaction was to hit the deck, so to speak, when I saw the flash of the exploding shell. Apparently, I wasn't fast enough this time for shrapnel struck on the right side of my face, although not too seriously. A medic in the bunker simply pulled the exposed shrapnel from my flesh and applied a bandage. Some splinters there were embedded in my skin that I carry to this day. The wound didn't incapacitate me, and I thought to myself, thank goodness I was very slight. It sort of gave me a good feeling that I would receive a verwundenabsaisen, wound badge or purple heart, without having to be taken out of action. Yet, 
here was my proof that I really had served at the front. I was wounded for the second time just a few days later. We were participating in a dry run maneuver along the Narva front before a scheduled attack just south of Leningrad. During this maneuver, I was the gunner of an assault gun, a tank from which the turret had been replaced with a rigid superstructure. The tank, although its 75mm gun is limited to only 24 degrees of lateral movement, had the advantage of a greatly reduced silhouette, a small target, and since the gun always pointed forward, the more heavily armored front of the vehicle would be exposed to the enemy. It was getting hot inside the cramped compartment of the tank, so I opened the small steel flap that covers the hole through which the gun optics traverse. I had done this many times before to let fresh air in, but suddenly I heard the impact of machine gun fire and felt a warm numbness in my head. My loader must have seen it right away, for he shouted, Rudy's been hit! The commander told the driver to turn around at once and head back. Later, while talking to my friends, they said that when they first saw me, they thought the top of my head had been torn off, what with all the blood. What was puzzling, however, was that I should be wounded when there was no other damage inside our tank. At first, we thought it must have been a sniper's round that ricocheted into the vehicle, but later, we learned that one of our infantrymen, who was riding on top of our tank, was firing his machine gun when he slipped and fired several rounds which struck the optics plate and entered our compartment. To make matters worse, I was given another tetanus shot by a doctor who was unaware of my receiving a shot just a few days before. My reaction to the second inoculation was rather painful. My whole body began itching. I developed welts and it felt like thousands of bugs were crawling all over me. I received credit for this second wound despite the fact that it was not caused by enemy fire. I was lucky, again, for a few days after this incident, my tank hit a mine during a real battle for which we practiced. My third wound occurred during my second front duty, just before the attempt on Hitler's life on July 20, 1944. This was a tragic event, for once again it was not caused directly by enemy fire. We were engaged in battle somewhere in Lithuania when one of our rounds of ammunition proved to be a Feldzunder, dud. When one of a round would occasionally fail to fire, such as this one did, our normal procedure was to wait at least seven seconds, unload the defective round, and continue. After waiting a considerable time, our tank commander ordered the shell extracted from the chamber, which the loader did manually. At this instance, all I remember was seeing a bright searing flame. I heard nothing, felt no explosion, and frankly did not know right away what happened. I looked back at our commander and saw him slumped over dead. The driver was coming out of his compartment below mine telling me, Get out! We've been hit! I dismounted from the tank as quickly as I could and went behind the tank for cover, followed by the loader and driver. The loader had his arm torn away, right below the shoulder, and when I asked the driver if he had anything with which we could control the bleeding, the wounded man seemed to realize his predicament and began crying, My arm! My arm! My arm! Later on, I heard that he became temporarily blind from the flash of the explosion. I, however, was more fortunate. Although I was sent to the field hospital for a few days, my wounds only consisted of some shrapnel in my face. The biggest one was above my right eye, and burns on my right arm and right side of my face. Though not very serious. Our commander, a first lieutenant, however, was killed instantly in the explosion. Once again, we did not know right away what happened, but an investigation later determined that it was our Feldzunder. Apparently, as the loader opened the chamber to extract the round, the slow fuse ignited the dud and it exploded inside our tank. My fourth and final wound occurred on August 8, 1944, on a beautiful summer day about two miles south of Rosine in Lithuania. Our tank was detailed to investigate, as the lead tank of the company, the activities of the Russians in the vicinity of Razainen. As we pulled up behind some bushes on a hill, I spotted a Russian T-34 tank diagonally crossing the valley in front of us. I had fired my first shot at the Russian tank when, at that instant, I sensed a shiny object approach our tank at a tremendous speed from the direction of 11 o'clock. Describing the event takes time, but this was an instantaneous occurrence. All I knew that danger was approaching, and before I could shout, Alf Passen, watch out! There was a bright flash, and then nothing. No sound. No following explosion. I subconsciously crawled out of the tank. I regained consciousness when kneeling on the ground behind the tank. I saw my driver also kneeling in front of me. 
What happened? I asked him, and he replied, We got hit. When I asked him where the other members of our crew were, he replied, They are dead. As the tank engine finally sputtered and died, I heard a moaning and told the driver, I think one of them is alive, let's help. As we both leaped onto the rear of the tank, we found the loader alive, but he had a gun in his hand and was preparing to shoot himself. This was often the reaction of a tank crew member who, when his tank was hit and he seemed unable to exit the vehicle, he preferred to commit suicide rather than go through the agony of slowly burning to death or to be captured by the Russians. I immediately knocked the weapon out of his hand and told the driver, help me pull him out. We tried, but found that we could not budge him for there was considerable debris through the tank's interior, which had his legs trapped. At that moment, we heard our commander begin to moan. We moved over to the left side of the tank, where we found him as securely caught in the wreckage as the loader. At that moment, Russian machine gun fire began strafing our disabled vehicle. So, following our trained reactions, we jumped off the tank and went behind it. Following this, my eyesight was getting progressively worse, so I asked the driver, do you see anything? Meaning, can you still see? He obviously thought that I was asking him if he saw any Russians, for he replied no. Well, I concluded in that case, I better go back for help. But when I informed of my intentions, he said, you look like a mess, your arms and face. It was only then that I realized that I was indeed wounded. Both of my arms were burned, the right one so severely that the skin was rolling up, my shirt was completely burned off on the right-hand side, and when I touched my face and head, all I could feel was a gooey mess. Moreover, my hair was totally burned away, and blood poured over my face. Considering the extent of my injuries, it was incredible that someone had to tell me that I was wounded before I realized that I was injured. With comprehension came pain, and I found that the only way I could relieve the excruciating condition of my arms was to raise them above me. It was like this that I stumbled my way back down the hill, barely able to see the track marks our tank made in the grass to the gravel pit where help and safety awaited. By this time, all that I could see was a milky blur in front of my eyes, and a voice called out, Who is that? Rudy from Tank 541, I replied. Oh my gosh, he exclaimed. Is anybody else alive? Yes, I answered. The other three are hurt, but we can't get them out and they need help. All right, he said. We are getting help for them. My sight by this time was almost completely gone, so I called out, I'm blind! You just stand there, help is coming, he replied. I was told later that one of the tanks broke away from the battle formation and towed my tank and crew back to safety. I went into unconsciousness, for all I remember was that someone was speaking to me while I was lying on a cot, most likely on the ground. Whatever he was saying seemed to me incomprehensible. According to my Verwundetenkarte, a tag with medical and other information that accompanies the wounded soldier, I was given the last rites by the chaplain. My loaders and my conditions were considered grave enough that they had given us up as beyond help and expecting us two to die shortly. They left us in the field hospital rather than ship us back to Germany. After about two weeks, during which time I was still unconscious, my health began to improve, and I recall gaining consciousness just as I was being unloaded from the troop train in Dresden, Germany. Before the battle that nearly took my life, we were informed of a new Russian tank, the Joseph Stalin III, that weighed 46 tons and fired 122mm projectiles. Because of its thick 120mm sloping armor, our 75mm rounds would simply bounce off its skin unless we hit it from the side at very close range. When I fired at the T-34 in the valley, I wasn't aware that there were a number of those monsters waiting two kilometers away at the edge of the forest. No sooner had I pulled the trigger than the Russian behemoth began firing. For once, the Russians struck our tank with their first round. The projectile hit our vehicle between the barrel and the barrel sleeve of our cannon. It tore our cannon off where it struck, and incredibly entered the exposed chamber where it detonated, causing our loaded round to detonate as well. This tremendous explosion caused our waiting rounds, though not the magazine, to instantly explode as well. Eyewitnesses stated that our welded assault gun's armored roof was propelled from its position by a sheet of flame that rose about a hundred meters into the air. I am sure this must have been an exaggeration. The force necessary to wrench that massive steel roof away from our tank and fling it through the air had to be considerable. 
Apparently, my training in mounting and dismounting in Bomberg, as well as in Rustenburg, paid off, for I must have subconsciously crawled off the tank and sought cover behind it. Since our assault gun was totally destroyed, and our crew miraculously lived through the ordeal, it became known as the Miracle Tank of the Eastern Front. Our driver, who had survived the incident relatively unscathed, would not talk for five days. He had withdrawn into a world all his own, so I was told. He eventually snapped out of it and was assigned to drive another tank. On his first day back at the front, he was driving his tank across a wooden bridge when it collapsed beneath him. Fortunately for the other crew members, they were sitting on the outside of the vehicle, but the driver was in his compartment at the front of the tank. When the tank crashed through the bridge, it turned upside down and entered the water below. The only fatality was my driver, who drowned while trapped in the sunken wreckage. For having been wounded four separate times, I received the Verwundeten Absarzen in silver. This badge was issued to any soldier who suffered more than three wounds, or for the loss of a hand, foot, eye, or complete deafness. Additionally, I was awarded the Panzerkampf Absarzen, tank assault badge, for having participated in at least three successful tank engagements. This could also be awarded for tank action against anti-tank actions. The third and most prestigious decoration awarded to me was the Eisernes Kreuz II Klasse, Iron Cross Second Class. This medal was given for bravery beyond the call of duty and quite an honor if the recipient, such as I, was below the rank of Unteroffizier. I was recommended for the Iron Cross First Class, but was for some reason denied the honor. My awards, however, basically stemmed from my having destroyed a total of six Russian tanks two of them on separate occasions, and the other four in a single battle. The destruction of the last four occurred one day when approximately twenty Russian tanks attempted to breach our lines near Narva, Estonia. Somehow I managed to smash all four in a matter of minutes, while another one of our tanks obliterated two in the same period of time. Meanwhile, our 88mm anti-aircraft anti-tank battery succeeded in destroying four additional Russian tanks. Upon losing ten tanks out of their original complement of twenty, the remaining Russians withdrew into the woods. There were other incidents, many of them leading up to the statement that I had described personal bravery and dedication of my comrades, that combined led to my receiving the award. That is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, remember to give it a like and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, until new meetings.